Hey, how are you guys doing today? Okay, that's, that's exciting. People are excited. Uh, I'm excited about this passage so much because one, it, it kind of has a, a sporting event, kind of athletic kind of vibe to it, and it also brings a lot of heat. And so, like, I've become, I think, like the grandpa of One Hope, so I'm really, like, kind and gentle. And I used to be really different when I was young. I was a little more fiery, and this passage kind of has a little more heat to it, so I get to kind of slide back into the days of old when I was more of a fiery guy, um, and I, I, I was gentle a little bit in the first service, and I told him, I am not going to let up on this second one. I am going to keep the pedal to the metal the whole time. If you at any point feel a little heat coming, rising up above, you know, through your seat, nobody has a fire under that. That's the Holy Spirit right there. Uh, okay, yeah. You, see, don't encourage me because you have no idea what's coming. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Um, we are in the book of Hebrews, and it's been interesting. I mean, if you've been with us the whole time, uh, hopefully you've learned a ton. You've learned a lot of theological things and a lot of things about Jesus that we didn't get in the Gospel of Mark because it was a bunch of stories. This is deeper. This is more intense. And we've found out that Jesus is so incredibly awesome, so much better than anything else we could ever find on earth. And he is the one that we run to, we cling to. But we've also noticed that in the author of Hebrews is saying, hey, listen, if he's so good, then you should continually grow in him. You should pay attention to the words that he speaks because he's talking about more important things than even the prophets of old or the angels brought in the Torah or the, the Old Testament scriptures. I mean, he is speaking real truth to you and you need to listen up. Pay attention to it because we don't want you to drift away from that even if you're going through difficult times. Stay close to him. Draw near to him. Hold fast to him. Don't drift. You know, it's, it's funny because there was a part of the passage of scripture a couple months ago where it even talked about people who had been following Jesus for a long time supposedly, but they hadn't grown very much. They were still kind of... Um, neophytes, newbies. They were spiritual babies and they only drank spiritual milk. And, and he said, you know, you ought to be teachers by now. You should grow up. You know, it's time to get out of your diapers and, you know, put on some real big boy pants and start moving as a follower of Jesus. And so, and this little chunk of passage, uh, this part of the scriptures, I think he's even bringing it a little bit harsher because he's going to talk a little bit about, hey, listen, if you're not moving toward Jesus, if you're not running after him, there might be a little discipline that comes your way and it's brought by God. Um, I believe God is a gracious God, a loving God. He, he saves us by faith and so there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. I mean, that's clearly in the scriptures, clearly in the teachings of the book of Hebrews that he can save us completely, not because of anything we've done, but because our high priest, Jesus, made the perfect sacrifice for us once and for all and brought us into a fellowship, a relationship with the living God and that is secure. But boy, what he says in this passage, it gets a little heated. Now, let me read it for you, and kind of you'll get to understand why I like it so much. I was a coach. I was a little bit of an athlete when I was really young, and so this kind of gets me excited. I've also been to the, a place where, where this probably would have taken place, and so when the author is talking about this, I mean, I've been to the place where they would have thought of this stadium, this idea of, of what the Christian life looks like. I don't know about some of you, but like, I get so... Um, Let's think of a nice word. Irritated, frustrated. When people reduce the Christian life, following Jesus to attending church. I mean, how boring is that? Like, well, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to go to my small group and sit on a couch and, whoa, I'm not following Jesus. No. And this, the author here says something, oh, I love it. He's, he's talking about an athletic competition. That's what the spiritual life is supposed to look like for people. 
He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I could say that five times. I love that passage. That's what the Christian life, it's a race. It's running hard after Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross Scoring its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Huh? Verse seven, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us And we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may may not be disabled, but rather healed. Now, that started out so strong and then kind of just tapered off a little bit. Got a little uncomfortable there in the middle, wouldn't you say? Well, what about the first part? You like that? How many of you were raised like as athletes or coaches or you're into sports or you get into sports now? How many? Come on, raise your hands. Okay, way better than the first one. I mean, I tell you what, I said that and like three hands went up. I went, oh shoot, I'm in the wrong church because I'm going to bring some, you know, um, some excitement, some intensity and, and you're all just going to go, oh, he's being mean, he's harsh. Um, I was a coach and, and uh, as an athlete, I was pretty intense. I um, got into, you know, a little foul trouble as basketball because I was always kind of aggressive. And, and then as a coach, I was very aggressive as well. I mean, it was, you know, like when I wanted to yell encouragement, I yelled encouragement. I didn't yell bad things too often, but um, I usually had good teams. And so I could just yell encouragement. And so, I mean, when, and I coached volleyball mostly because my kids played it. And um, when somebody would block, I would be on the bench as the coach, you know, like base, the biggest cheerleader. Yeah! And, and I would say to the person who just blocked it, hey, hey, you got to inspire your, your, your team, you know? You got to turn around and let out a growl of some sort, you know? Because that's, 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 that's sports, man. That's athletics. Um, I'll never forget, like, we had one, one player who, who I so desperately, I mean, the person had incredible talent, incredible, like, physical attributes. I mean, this person could have been incredible, but they were always, like, so half-hearted, And I thought, oh, if I could just yell some intensity into this person, they would be so... And it was funny because my kids would always grit their teeth when they were playing. They were like me. And, And when I hear this passage, I think that's what I love about the Christian life because it's referred to as something like an athletic competition. Sometimes it's even a battlefield. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. Don't run half-hearted. Don't be wimpy about this. Go after this, baby. That's kind of where I'm at. You know, that's kind of my personality. I really enjoy the idea of of looking at the Christian walk as as training for like the games, the Olympics or or a running race. I mean, that's kind of what I'm into. And so for those of you who are not there, you're going, whoa, what did I just walk into? Um, Yes, Bobby Knight was my favorite coach. I know that's just horrible. I don't, 
I don't think anything he did, you know, was good, but he was intense. And I, when I was growing up playing basketball, my high school coach and him were good friends. And so we always got like a, a taped uh, pep talk before games from Bobby Knight. And he would just yell at us. And I was like, yes, I love this. So when he says, hey, I want you to run after Jesus with everything that's in you because that's what the Christian life is like. I was uh, in Turkey a number of times, if we go to the picture, um, and followed a guy named Ray Vanderlaan, and he makes videos, and uh, he took us to this place. I've been here twice, and it was just incredible. The first time you see, for the first time, you, you walk into the, the stadium through that big hole there, and, and you walk into it, and the next picture shows how kind of how big it is. It's huge. This is an ancient stadium that held like 40,000 people. I mean, think about how... how you would go to a place, I mean, the, the city wasn't even that big, but people would come from miles around, hundreds of miles around to be at the stadium where, where the games would take place, kind of like Olympic, Olympic games. And this is sort of the pentathlon, which is five events, running and javelin throw and boxing and the discus and wrestling and this whole, I mean, all these things. But really, we're talking about this running race. And um, I'd like to kind of move this from ancient stadiums to make more stadiums of, of, of modern, um, there you go. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> if you've ever been to the big stadium of your choice, this has been my choice. If you've ever been there when the whole crowd is cheering, you begin to understand what he says is, oh, since we are surrounded by such an incredible cloud, and the idea of a cloud is that you cannot see any one specific face, but you know that everyone there is there rooting for you. Since we are surrounded by such this incredible cloud of witnesses, witnesses, the idea of a martyr, Martyrios is a witness, someone who has given their life for the faith. And we've heard last couple of weeks about these people, Moses, Abraham, Barak, and or say hi for me. Um, <laughs> Isaac, Jacob, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, all the prophets who were there and who, who ran after God with all they had. And even when opposition came, they continued to have faith in God. Even the people who had given their lives in the more recent years, right before he writes this book, people who have been sawn in two or they had to wear like animal skins and then they were sent out so that wild dogs and lions would come and eat them. I mean, people who were sawn in half, seriously, and lived in caves. They, they ran around and, and they were always giving their life for their faith. They were giving their life as followers of Jesus. And even these days, that still happens. 150 to 200,000 people give their life for the faith. They give their life for Christ. And they're the ones who are surrounding us, and we're the ones on the field. Now, the, the passage, it would seem like, look up into the stands. He says, no, 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 no. It's not about you looking up into the stands. It's that they are all watching you live your Christian life. They're all watching you run after Jesus. Now, when I think about the idea of this enormous crowd of people who have who have gone before me, who have been faithful even to the point of death, people who have given their life for Christ, watching me run after Jesus, and I have like this, like, man, it's too hot in here. I'm sweating a little bit. And they gave their life. I, like, I, there, there's a different feeling for me when I realize that there are is an enormous group of people who have gone before me who have given their life for Christ and they are now watching me. They're watching you as well. They're watching you run after Jesus. Does that, does that put any different responsibilities? Does it make you feel like something is more important now than, than what it was before? that all these people are watching you go after it. And so he says, I want you to throw off everything that hinders. And this is like a weight. I don't know if you know what uh, rucking is. You put a rucksack, you put a bunch of weight on your back and you walk a long way. And that's kind of a new hip cool exercise that people do. 
Imagine trying to run with 150 pounds of stuff on your back. It's crazy. You wouldn't never do that. You'd never try to run a, a sprint or a marathon with 150 pounds on your back. And so he says, get rid of anything like that. Now, it's not sin because he says in the next line that, and the sin that so easily entangles and the idea of having like a huge robe or a, uh, maybe you've gone to a wedding before. I, I'm a pastor, so I see a lot of these things. Have you ever seen a, a woman try to, um, a bride necessarily, try to walk in a wedding dress? I, I always want to say, oh, somebody's got to come up with something that just keeps their feet from stepping. I mean, it just, it's so horrible. And he's like, I, I, can I help? And because I'm always the person who's watching it happen. It's like, I, I got to go help. I got to go help her. And I want to run down and just kind of lift it up to her like knees and say, come on, come on. But it's the idea that this thing is entangling. You can't run very fast because it's all around you and it's capturing your legs and it's making you trip. And so that's this sin. So it's this weight stuff that's not sin. It's stuff that maybe is good stuff, but it just weighs you down. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. When I was in Turkey and RVL that Ray was teaching, I mean, he would make us run around the the circle a couple times, and then we'd stop and he'd teach us. And then at the end, he would say, do you really want to follow Jesus? Then you better run! And he'd just get crazy, and we would like, yes, sir! We're just running around. And I'll never forget with a, the last time we were there, because I took a good friend of mine, and he had played football in college, and he was a pretty intense athlete, and I remember at the end, he ran and ran and ran, and at the end, he just collapsed at the finish line. And Ray walked over to him and he said, you know what? When I was a freshman in high school, I ran my first cross-country meet. And I ran as fast as I could the entire way. When I got to the end, I puked my brains out. I was so embarrassed. I won the race, but it was so embarrassing to puke and be sick like that that I never ever ran that hard again. I never won another race. I never did anything. And he was talking to uh, Josh, not the Josh you know, but another guy. And Josh said, that's how I've lived my Christian life. I have been half-hearted at best. I don't know if you know, but when you walk in here, you see a sign that says, we are trying to raise up passionate disciples who love sacrificially. If you whiz by it too fast, you might look up and think it says, we're trying to raise up passive disciples who love sometimes. That's not the case at all. And that's not what we're called to by the author of Hebrews. We're not called to that by Jesus. We are called to be passionate disciples, full of intensity and focus and intentionality. We're supposed to run after him with everything that's in us and keep our eyes focused on him in the interesting stadium that they have. The, the king or the, the prince or the ruler or whatever, he was worshiped as a god. So they'd put him at the end of the track. And so people would run after him. They would focus on that person. And they were really trying to run toward him, saying that he is worthy of our worship and worthy of our very best effort. And the one who would win the prize would, would be like, you know, offered up a seat right by him. So when the author says, I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of it, the guy who started this whole thing and this, the guy who will end this whole thing, I want you to focus on him and run after him with everything that's in you. First Corinthians, Paul says, do you not know that in the race all the runners run, right? They've heard that. He says, everyone who goes into the games, who competes in the games, they do it to get a crown that will never last. But we do it when we're running after Jesus, we get a crown that will last forever. And so we're called to go into strict training. We're supposed to go into an intentionally focused and intensive training so that we can follow Jesus as very best we can to run after him with everything that's in us. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Can you believe that he would do that? Do you believe that he would go through all that he went through for us knowing at the end knowing after the cross that he would be glorified by God and he would draw all of us to himself. He decided to go through all that pain, all that struggle. 
He endured the cross, even the shame that it laid upon him, the curse it was laid upon him. He says, forget it. I don't care because in the end, I will be with God and I'm gonna draw all my friends, all my buddies, all the people that I love and that I've done this for, I'm gonna draw all of them to myself. And he sat down at the right hand of God. And so the author is kind of playing on these Olympic games, this contest to help us understand what the Christian life is supposed to look like. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. And he did endure a lot of opposition. So we've already seen that there are weights that weigh us down so that we can't run very fast. There's this thing that tangles up our legs and so we can't move very fast. There's always this opposition also from sinful men that are keeping us from running after God the way we want to. And so all these things are holding us back, hindering us. Consider him who endures his opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I have to believe that you've known somebody who is following Jesus who at some point in their life has grown weary and lost heart. Do you know them? Maybe you've even done that. When all the opposition is coming your way, when you're struggling with sin, when all the things that you think are good are really keeping you from enjoying the best of the relationship that you have with God. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Can you believe that he's asking us, he's saying, listen, you're following Jesus. You're following a guy who went through the cross, who endured all that shame and the whole pain thing, and he got to the end and he was brought into the presence of God, experiencing all that joy, and to do that, he shed his blood, he gave his life. You haven't done that yet. Are, are you going to go and, and do the things that Jesus did? And are, is that how are you going to follow after God? And then he changes the whole thing. He goes from these Olympic games, and I, which I'm like totally into, to a, a, a weird set of um, parenting metaphors. It's like being a parent now. Okay, fine. You're not a coach anymore. Now you're a parent, right? Similar, but slightly different. The relationship is different. He says, you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons or children. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Anybody uncomfortable with that? Is anybody else uncomfortable with that? Like, I'm uncomfortable with that. Okay, I'm fine. I can get some instruction, some teaching, some discipline. I get that. I'll even take some rebuke because those are only words. Somebody, but then he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. It's a passage from the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, talking about God's nature of a parent, as a parent, to do absolutely everything in his power to help us run after Jesus the way we should. To keep all the, the sin that so easily entangles and the weights that weigh us down and keep us from running the fastest we can. The Lord disciplines, and that word comes from um, like pedagogy or uh, pediatrics. It's about nurturing. It's about being uh, an instructor. It's about, about bringing to fruition and to wholeness a child. And then do not lose heart when he rebukes you. The idea of rebuke is, is words, reproof, taking the word of God and, and lining someone's life up to it and say, listen, this is what God's word has called you to. This is how you're living. The, see the difference? That's a reproof, correction. And then the last one, he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Now, I don't like the word punish, but the word really is, uh, is about taking like a cat of nine tails or, uh, or a, a whip and, and, and scourging someone. When Jesus was going to the cross, before he went to the cross, he was whipped with a cat of nine tails and he was scourged, he was, he was beaten. And, and that's what that phrase is. Now, I'm not comfortable with that at all. But I realize, as a parent, there are times when Rather than have my child really wind up into a horrible experience, like um, one of my kids went to Iowa um, yesterday. They were driving to Iowa for a wedding. Now, I think it's very flat, 
And, um, but but I, I went to uh, Arkansas once, and, and there were lots of mountains and stuff. And I remember driving, and, and I was with some high school, or high school friends, and, um, and there were guardrails on, on the roads. And, and I loved those guardrails, but I always thought, you know, especially when Andy was driving, you don't know him, um, he was going so fast, and he would get really close to those guardrails. And I thought, you know what? That guardrail's really going to hurt when I hit it. But... Better than going over the edge of the cliff and winding up dead completely. And I always thought about, you know, when, like, Sammy's driving out there, it's like, okay, I I would hate for her to get hurt, but if nothing else, I hope something keeps her from going off into anything worse. That's what a parent feels. It's like, I would rather have my child injured or hurt rather than die. So, so... It seems like God kind of begins the process kind of gently. He's nurturing. He's, he's being kind. He's, he's um, just teaching and instructing. And then if it, we're not listening very well, then he, rebu- he rebukes. He reproves. He says, listen, this is how the word of God looks, and this is how you're living. It's not measuring up. You need to get with the program, I guess is the best way to say it. And if that isn't happening, if this person still is going off, man, this is going to get intensely hard. It's going to get difficult. Now, I hate the idea of that. I do know this, that God never condemns his, his child. There's never a place where he, he destroys or, or brings condemnation, but there is training, there is discipline, there is even scourging. It's interesting because John chapter 15, Jesus says a very similar thing. He's talking about um, people who are connected to God through him. You know, God is this... this vine and, and they're the branches and, and um, he, he says finally, he says, I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. He's the one who, who takes care of the vine and the branches. And so he's talking about how, how people are supposed to be so connected to Jesus that they eventually bear fruit, that they, that they make grapes. Uh, we had some grapes in the back here and I was eating them and thinking, oh, it's so good to bear fruit. And that's what God has called us to. That's what Jesus has called us to. The same way of running after Jesus is running after him, going after him with everything. The same way as when you do that, you're supposed to bear fruit. That's how Jesus describes this idea. I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's the first part of the passage. So he says that we're connected But when a branch does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And that's kind of a weird word. Um, Bible teacher that I know uh, many years ago, he said the word is arrow. And, And the word is, it means to lift up off the ground. And he said, most vine dressers would not wipe out a branch that could bear fruit. Instead, they would lift it up, they would attach it back to the trellis and clean it off and hope that the sun would come and, and mend it and then it would begin to bend fruit, so it, or to bear fruit again. And it's sort of the idea of nurturing once again. And so if you're not bearing fruit, God comes and I believe he lifts you up and he, he tries to clean you off. He kind of cleans off, a little, sound, kind of like instruction, kind of like reproof. And here's what I, this guy said, and I just heard this um, a couple days ago. I'd heard the teaching 20 years ago, but then as I um, dove into it a little bit this week, he said he had been teaching this all around the country for, for many years. The idea of, of some people don't bear fruit, some people bear fruit, some people bear more fruit, and then people bear much fruit. So it was kind of a uh, nothing all the way up to much. And he said as he went through churches, and all across America and all across Europe, people would self-identify bearing no fruit. 60% of the people in the churches that he was a part of would self-identify as bearing no fruit in their life. And I thought, wow. Now, there's nurturing, there's lifting up, there's probably a little reproof that needs to happen, but, but how many of you would say, okay, even self-identifying, yeah, I don't, probably don't see a whole lot of fruit in my life. And fruit can be different things. It, fruit can be like character qualities, um, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, those things. Fruit 
really specifically in the Bible talks about good works, that you do things for God. Um, God had said that you are in Christ, and in Christ you are God's workmanship, and he created good things for you to do even before the beginning of time. And so they're the good works that he has called you to, the things that only he knows, but he will clearly share with you so that you can do those things to bear fruit for him. And I should also imagine that it's about people who have right now who do not know Jesus, who because of your life, because of your influence, they came to know Jesus and were beginning to be nurtured in their relationship with Jesus. That is all fruit. And yet 60% of the people who he talked to said they were bearing no fruit. And when, when 60% of the church is not bearing fruit, that's a problem. And where are you at there? I think the Lord wants to come and pick you up, clean you off, nurture you, begin to instruct you so that you can bear fruit. And then he says, this is interesting, like, because I think it should read differently, quite frankly. If I was writing the, writing the Bible, which um, I didn't get a chance to do this, he says, every branch that bears fruit, like I think, he celebrates and cheers and it's all good. No, it says every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Ugh! He prunes. He prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You see, I think God is more interested in bearing a lot of fruit, seeing our lives bear a lot of fruit, than our comfort, than our, hey, it's too warm in here. I'm sweating. That's why we're black. We're black. It works better. <laughs> He's more interested in our lives not show, being comfortable but in bearing more fruit. So he says he prunes you. Now, I don't know if you know that prune, I think that hurts. I don't know, but if somebody cut off my finger, it would be painful. And he does that. He comes and cuts, uh, and I, I watched vine dressers do it when I was in Israel and then in Turkey. There was, oh, it was a great place, but there was tons of grapes. Me and a friend, I, uh, he had a blister, and so I sat with him near this stream in a uh, nice big vineyard, and <laughs> I, I, I turned around to a... A, you know, the thing of a gun. And he says, what are you doing here? And I went, um, my, my friend has a blister. We're just, we're not taking any of your fruit. And, and then he said, oh, sorry. He put away the gun and got out his little printing thing and kind of gave us a lesson on how he did it, things. And so he would cut things off that weren't bearing fruit. There would be like this, this vine thing and this branch thing that went out and it was just leaves. And so there was sap going to those things, but it wasn't bearing any fruit because there was no fruit being produced at the end. And so he would cut that so that the sap could go back to the grapes and it could be more plump and more delicious and more sweet. And so I realized, oh, that's a painful process, cutting things off like that, but it does, in fact, help someone bear more fruit. The last verse, verse five, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So somebody who is not bearing fruit, he's lifted up, he's taken away. He's, he's kind of lifted up and nurtured. And somebody who's bearing um, no fruit, he's, and then he gets some fruit, then they prune him and then they have more fruit. And then someone who begins to abide in God to really know God, to be in his presence, to be nurtured continually by him, he bears much fruit. And that's what God wants for us. He is fully committed to seeing us bear fruit, no matter what kind of discipline, reproof, scourging, punishment we have to go through. Because in the end, it's always training us to be more like him. This is how it continues on. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And that's just common sense. We've seen kids who weren't disciplined, right? Who just kind of run amok and it's horrible. If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children, not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. <laughs> Why did that just come into my mind? I was about six years old one time. I'm laying in front of the TV, and I was eating chips. And we had one of those Charles chip cans. You ever see? I mean, you got to be old for one of these. They're like yellow and brown, Charles chips. 
And my dad grabbed the thing and he put the lid on and he held it over my head. And he dropped it. Now, it slipped out of his hand, but it hit my head and gave me like this really cool um, mouse or goose, I don't know what you call it, goose egg. Um, and I'm like, what'd you do that for? And, and I know he felt horrible, but he said, well, if you wouldn't have brought the chip can out here, I wouldn't have done it. And I was like, <laughs> fathers aren't always great at disciplining, right? Fathers, as parents, we, we fail oftentimes. I, I, I just threw him under the bus. I could have used an example, a hundred of examples of mine with my kids, but I threw my dad under the bus. Um, that's not good. <laughs> How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? God is not a father like that, is he? He's a father that knows exactly what we need. He knows really the the status of our hearts, our motivations, everything that, that we believe, that we care about. He, he knows us completely. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. They tried their best. But God disciplines us for our good. And why? That we may share in his holiness. This is about our growth in Christ's likeness. This is about us being more and more like Jesus. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, and if you're going, uh, undergoing some of the discipline of the Lord right now, you know this hurts. It's not fun. Trying to get rid of my sin or trying to lay down something that is somewhat good, but it's keeping me from running the, as fast as I can after Jesus. All those things, this opposition is coming from people. All of those things can be painful at times, but they do their good work to change us, to make us more and more like God, to make us more and more holiness, and more holy. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness, our righteousness before God, us living the right way in peace for those who have been trained by it. How committed are you to bear fruit for God? And how willing are you to undergo the discipline of the Lord to get that? Think about right now, what is a sin that right now entangles you? What, what is making you trip up? What is something in your life right now that's just keeping you from, from running fast? It's tripping you up all the time. What? right now is maybe a good thing in your life, but it's a weight. It's a thing that's keeping you weighed down so that you can't run fully after God. Are there any of those things in your life? What are oppositions that are coming toward you from other people that are keeping you from running after God? It's interesting at the end, To strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. In the end, he's talking about our healing. He's not talking about all this pain that's coming toward us. He, he says, you know what, your, your arms right now, they're just kind of hanging low. If you know, he's no basketball coach, you know your players tire when they grab the bottom of their shorts and they're kind of holding on by them when your arms are weak. Your knees is fear. Usually weak knees, it always means fear. So you're tired and you're afraid. And God says, what I want you to do is make the straight path. I want to be absolutely focused on Jesus, focused on who he is, and run after him. Run with everything that's in you. Continue to run no matter what. No matter what comes your way, continue to run after Jesus. So the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. See, in the end, he will heal you. He will make you whole once again, and he will allow you to run after him. It was interesting, um, before we started worship in the first service, we were back in the office, I think it's the little pit back there. And we always pray and worship a little bit. And Kat was talking about Jesus, who on the night he was betrayed, he had last supper with his disciples. 
He knew that the cross was coming ahead of him. And it says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, that after they were together and they remembered the Passover meal when God took a lamb and slayed it and put the blood over the doorposts and lintels, after they commemorate God's merciful act, they worshiped. They worshiped in the midst of their struggle. Now, I don't know what you're struggling with right now. I don't know what God has you in the midst of. Whether you're being disciplined, whether you're bearing fruit and he's pruning you so you will bear more fruit. I do know this. He is absolutely committed to seeing your life bear fruit. And we're committed that too, to that too here. We want you to be passionate disciples who love sacrificially, who run after Jesus with everything that's in you and bear fruit to the glory of God. And so sometimes, even in the midst of your struggle, like Jesus, you have to worship. You have to proclaim the goodness of God with everything. So I want to invite you to stand. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for being committed to our growth. Committed to our transformation. Committed to our souls being more and more like Jesus all the time. And we proclaim, we'll we'll go through anything just as Jesus did for the joy set before us to be with you and to be able to bear fruit for you to your glory, for your fame. One day we want to stand with you. We want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. So do your work in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.